Over the years exploring North Carolina, we have shared with you the best of North Carolina's earthbound natural resources. We've studied botany, geology, paleontology, and ornithology. But what about the sky above and worlds beyond our own? Nothing has puzzled or excited humans more than the study of our solar system and the universe. Today we're going to examine North Carolina's role in the study of astronomy, our place in space. You might ask if the study of astronomy has any application to science on Earth and to North Carolina's economic future. There is no better person to answer this question than Dr. Dan Reichert, Associate Professor of Astronomy and Physics and Director of the Skynet Robotic Laboratory at the Moorhead Planetarium. Well, there's a, a need in this nation for more engineers, more chemists, physicists, um, biological technicians, medical technicians, medical scientists of all sorts, all varieties. Um, but there's never really a, a need or a demand for more astronomers. So the question is, where, does, where do astronomers fit in? And there is something that astronomy has to offer that I think is really important, and that is it's, it, it's a hook. It's a way to get young people and people of all ages interested in science in these other fields. It's kind of, I like to refer to astronomy as the gateway drug to the sciences. Uh, there's a little bit of physics in it, a little bit of chemistry in it, and all these great, amazing concepts that you can't help but be interested in. Uh, we're talking about the largest masses in the universe, the largest energies, the biggest explosions, the greatest distances, the greatest uh, spans of time, going all the way back to the beginning of time, the beginning of the universe. Who can't be excited about concepts like that? And so it's a way to get young people, and, and as I said, people of all ages, interested in science. Uh, they can't all be astronomers. The job market in astronomy just won't handle it, but hopefully they find something interesting. Uh, if you take a star and take a spectrum of it, you can see its chemical signature. Well, maybe some of those people will become chemists. Uh, people who are interested in the hardware, the telescopes, and how you build them, maybe those people will become engineers. So I, I think of it as a gateway, a gateway drug to the sciences. I told you that part of Dan Reichert's work is at the Moorhead Planetarium, which has long been the center of space study in North Carolina. I asked Planetarium Director Dr. Todd Boyette about the history of space study in North Carolina and at Chapel Hill. The study of astronomy began at UNC Chapel Hill during the very early days of UNC Chapel Hill. The first plan of education passed in 1792 included the study of astronomy. But it really did not take hold until the 1820s under President uh, Joseph Caldwell, who actually traveled to England to purchase equipment, uh, telescopes, uh, armillary sphere, and he, along with uh, Professor Elisha Mitchell, taught uh, astronomy, made astronomical observations. Uh, Dr. Caldwell himself built the nation's first observatory on a college campus using his own money. It may be of interest to you to know that the first university observatory was located on what is now Franklin Street at the site of the home of the UNC system president. Few places in America are more associated with the study of the universe than the Moorhead Planetarium in Chapel Hill. Todd Boyette told me how it came to be. The spark that motivated John Moorhead to build the planetarium and give it to the state of North Carolina was a statement by Harlow Shapley from Harvard University, uh, an eminent astronomer of his day, and uh, went on record saying that North Carolinians were the most astronomically ignorant people in the country. He actually visited North Carolina and, and gave a talk and made that claim, based that claim on the fact that he never received letters from anyone from North Carolina about the heavens. He would usually get questions from people uh, from uh, 
all states across the country. Uh, what is this star that I saw? What was this I saw in the night sky last night? Never received any questions from North Carolina. Uh, John Moorhead in response said, if you mean that North Carolinians are ignorant of astronomical matters, then we can fix that. I'll build a planetarium. The Moorhead Planetarium has been North Carolina's astronomy classroom for 60 years. Uh, we opened in 1949 and since then have, have served uh, over 7 million visitors. Um, currently we see 80,000 to 85,000 school children a year. Uh, they usually come in the elementary years. Uh, they may return as middle schoolers, sometimes as adults. Um, with their children. It's a rite of passage um, in many ways. Uh, we did a, a statewide survey two years ago and found out that uh, one-third of North Carolinians uh, over the age of 18 have been to the Moorhead Planetarium at least once in their lives. Considering the changing nature of the population uh, in North Carolina, we were, were very pleased with that. The centerpiece of the Moorhead Planetarium is the Carl Zeiss Model 6 Star Planetarium Projector. Exploring North Carolina visited this marvelous machine. The planetarium has a long history of educating young scientists, but the United States government also looked to Chapel Hill when its astronauts needed training. The Moorhead Planetarium has, has a wonderful tradition of training uh, budding scientists and students in its 60-year history. Um, today, we still um, have astronomy classes, uh, undergraduates taking astronomy classes in our planetarium dome. We uh, work with undergraduates. We hire as many as 100 undergraduate students to help us with our programming, uh, content development, program delivery. And we have a great relationship with the science departments across campus, helping them um, convey for the general public what current science research is and what kind of science research is happening on campus. Moorhead Planetarium played a major role in the uh, early stages of the NASA um, space program. Uh, we trained over 60 astronauts in the Apollo program from 1960 to 1975 in celestial navigation. 11 out of the 12 uh, people who've walked the face of the moon trained right here in Chapel Hill. Um, wonderful part of our history. Uh, there have been three missions where celestial navigation has been critical in the survival of the astronauts. The telescope at the Moorhead Observatory is not as useful as it once was. I asked Todd Boyette about the effects of light pollution on our night skies. With our urban sprawl, our suburban development, our dense urban development, um, we are losing our uh, night sky at an alarming rate. Uh, two thirds of uh, Americans live in a place where they cannot see the Milky Way. All living things have evolved with a definite dark and light time of the 24-hour cycle. And as our dark skies diminish, there is an impact on uh, the ecosystems and on living things. Uh, just like it would not be healthy if we were exposed to uh, darkness all the time, it's just as uh, unhealthy to be exposed to light. It's only been within the last 20 to 30 years that we have created uh, a permanent twilight state in our environment, and those have negative impacts. Have you ever wanted to get away from the noise and bright lights of the city to a place where the stars seem a whole lot closer? We found such a place in the mountains of North Carolina, and it comes with its own giant radio telescope. This place called Perry, Pisgah Astronomical Research Institute, was once a secure NASA space installation. I had heard rumors about this off-limits government facility while trout fishing as a teenager in the 1960s. Now I was a guest. The president of Perry is Don Klein, an engineer, entrepreneur, and great supporter of science education. Pisgah Astronomical Research Institute is located 
in the Pisgah Forest, which is about 500,000 acres. NASA selected this site because it was a quiet location from all the clutter from all the cities. It was some distance from anything that was nearby that would generate and create clutter for them. Well, in 1980, uh, the satellites that were being placed in orbit, uh, some of those were communication satellites, so NASA found it not necessary to maintain 22 locations. And as a result, it became a surplus location. Uh, DOD, D uh, Department of Defense, held their hand up and said, well, we will take it. So it moved to their management for the next 15 to 20 years. When Don Klein discovered this extraordinary facility, he knew this equipment had to be saved for science education. Don secured additional lands for Pisgah National Forest and swapped them for the old tracking station. The equipment was saved and Perry, a nonprofit foundation, was formed. Don's excitement for this location is still evident. Traveling down here, I found that this is an exciting place. It has a lot of uh, buildings, 40-some buildings and you know, air conditioning. It has all the, it's a university campus without any students and a lot of parking places. Don Klein recruited top scientists and educators, including science director, Dr. Michael Castellez. I asked Dr. Castellez about the outreach programs offered by Perry. What's really unique about Perry is that we have research going on and education going on, but they go on together. And students will come here and work alongside the professional researchers doing real astronomical or atmospheric research or uh, ge geological research projects. The, the students aren't handed some experiment off the shelf and mix things together and something happens. That's not what we do here. And I, I think that's a truly unique experience. For, for example, we'll have students um, coming up here and spending a week with us building their own telescopes to observe the moon. And they'll be observing the moon, but they'll be doing it because they're helping us on a research project with NASA uh, looking for lunar impacts. These same students are also going to learn how to use a telescope that's connected to the UNC Chapel Hill Skynet project, which is monitoring the sky for gamma ray bursts. It's all real research and what we find is not only do the researchers get excited because they see this next generation coming up along the line, but the students get excited because they have some ownership of a true research project and they can go home and tell their friends and neighbors, you know what I did. You know, I helped find a gamma ray burst. You know, that's just so cool. And, and I, we think it just gets the students on a whole new track, not only of thinking critically, but, um, uh, but also just being excited about science and looking at careers in science and technology and engineering and math, which is one of our missions here. Perry has programs for homeschooled children, a program for talented high school students in robotics, and a Duke tip talent identification program for science students from across the U.S. and several foreign countries. Perry conducts its own scientific research and collaborates with top scientists in area universities. This particular institute can be thought of as a lab that all the universities can use and it would be a place that no single university really would be able to build by themselves. So one I want to describe is, is a project that we're collaborating on with Dr. Dan Reichert at UNC Chapel Hill. And Dr. Reichert's experiment deals with the observation of the most explosive events in the universe. They're called gamma ray bursts. And the way his experiment works and, and how we're part of it is that a, a, a satellite is orbiting the Earth and it's called SWIFT. It's orbiting the Earth looking for something that flashes but not in the optical. You can't see it with your eyes. It's, it happens in gamma rays. So this telescope sees a gamma ray burst. As soon as it sees it, it sends a signal down to Earth, uh, onto the internet, and all telescopes that are connected to the network, which Dr. Riker calls Skynet, um, all the telescopes on Skynet see, hear the signal and point the telescopes where this gamma ray bursts and try to get the very first optical flash from these objects. So our telescope, we have a 0.4 meter optical telescope 
that's connected to Skynet. And when one of the one of the gamma ray bursts go off, and it's in the northern hemisphere, he has telescopes all around the world. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, our telescope is going to point at that object. After hearing so much about Skynet from Dr. Castellez and other scientists, we visited with Dr. Dan Reichert at the Skynet Command Center at the Moorhead Planetarium. Well, I work on the fourth floor of Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center, and this is Skynet Command and Control, Skynet Headquarters. And this is where we develop the software to control the telescopes. It's where we develop the hardware, the telescopes themselves. We torture test the hardware, and then we ship it off to points all around the world. We have a bunch of telescopes in the Chilean Andes. We're helping people from all across the U.S. put uh, their campus observatories, their private observatories under the control of our software. And now we're moving into Europe as well. And my space up on the fourth floor is a place where we can look over everything as it's happening. We can call up images of telescopes from any location. We have a microphone and a webcam on every telescope on the system. So at any point we can bring it up, look at it, move it around, make sure it's functioning as it's supposed to. We have a microphone on it. So as Skynet is operating and just taking these images, image after image after image for hundreds, even thousands of users, we just listen to them in the background and make sure that everything's okay. And if something does go wrong, uh, Skynet, the software, is smart enough to, one, try to correct it itself, and if it can't, it rings our cell phones. So even if we're not at work, if we're at home, our cell phones go off, we get a message from Skynet and telling us what exactly is wrong, and we log in, and we can fix most things remotely. We don't actually have to be at the site to fix most things. We do thousands and thousands of observations for hundreds of users each night around the world, and also in the state of North Carolina, uh, high school students, elementary school students, and students through all the undergraduate institutions in the state. After being dazzled in the Skynet Command Center, Dan Reichert took me to the largest telescope in the building, the telescope in the Moorhead Observatory. On the fourth floor, uh, actually right above the fourth floor, we have Moorhead Observatory which is different from the planetarium. The planetarium is the chamber that you go into to see stars projected. The observatory is the telescope. And the observatory and the space under it uh, is part of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Um, but because it's here at Moorhead, it gives me an opportunity to be at this building and work with all these people in this building. During our visit at the Moorhead facility and at Perry, we learned about two types of telescopes in use optical and radio telescopes, and why it is important to preserve images from both. Perry serves a very important function as an astronomical archive. We talked with Thurburn Barker, director of the Perry Archive. Uh, we have about 100,000 different images in the archive. Our collection has photographic images, astronomical images, on glass plates, photographic negatives, as well as prints. And these uh, amount to about 50 or so thousand glass plates, 42,000 circular negatives, and about 10,000 images of meteors that were obtained in the 1950s by Harvard and Smithsonian Institute. We have two types of images on our plates. We have what we call direct images and spectral images. The direct images are images of the stars pretty much as you see them. When you look up, you're looking at what we would call a direct image. It's unaided unless, of course, we use filters. From that, we can determine the variability of the light intensity of a star. That gives us certain physical information. We can determine in general what spectral class that star might be. But most importantly, we have spectral images. The spectral images are prismatic images, images that you would see if, when looking at a rainbow. You see from the blue to the red. Well, we see the same thing, although we can cover a little wider spectrum than your eye can see. From that information, though, we can determine the composition of the star. We can determine what it's made of. We can see if it has iron, oxygen, calcium, hydrogen, helium, etc. 
All that's available in a spectral image. The images on our plate take us back in time. We can go back 100 years, a 1, thousand, many thousands, millions, and now even billions of years. And recently we've gone back to approximately 13 billion years. Now we understand by the Big Bang Theory that the age of our universe is approximately 13.7 billion years. So we're getting closer to the time when the first elements were formed. On our images, it's important for us, even though we only have 100 years or so of images, it's important for certain events that occur now to be able to go back, look at these images to determine where that star was, what happened at that time, what did it look like, how was it made up, and how does it relate to the event that we are looking at right now that makes us curious to go back. So why is it important to maintain astronomical records, some over a hundred years old? Those events include novas. A nova occurring now, we might see that it's in a location where there didn't seem to be anything, but if we can find a photographic plate that has a, that particular event at that location, and it is a star that we can see, then we might get information about where was that star in its evolutionary path? And does that fit with our models? And does it confirm our theory? Now you know that North Carolina is not only a great place to study a tremendous diversity of plants and animals, we are also a great place to study space. Because of the programs and facilities at the Moorhead Planetarium and at Perry, John Motley Moorhead could boast today that North Carolinians are among the nation's most astronomically intelligent people. Join us again soon for another episode of Exploring North Carolina.